All right, happy Sabbath. Good to see all of you out this afternoon. We'll get right to it um, and get into our message for this afternoon. This morning, I did comment on the fact that with the coronavirus going around, how, you know, the, there's a bit of panic in some people, um, but you got to keep it in perspective. You know, over every day, over 26,000 people die of cancer, 24,000 die of heart disease, um, and the, one of the statistics I use this morning is that every day, like 1,300 people are actually killed by other people. Um, so, and that's not because they sneezed on them, it's because they like meant to kill them, you know. Uh, so keep it in perspective and wash your hands. That's like the biggest thing uh, we can do is wash our hands. The Bible tells us that these things would happen, amen. So we as Christians should not be surprised. Let's get right into this. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter for our scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 16, says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Our message this afternoon is entitled, A Bowl of Pride. A Bowl of Pride. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to serve you and to, and to study your word. I ask now, Lord, that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, once again, I ask, Lord, that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say, amen. So we're going to jump to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 25, starting at verse 28. The Bible says, and Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So our story starts with a dysfunctional family. Here's a family where twins are born. The father loves one twin and the mother loves the other twin. It's a problem because the twins were in sibling rivalry from the womb. Do you remember the story that when, when they were being born and Esau is coming out first, Jacob is still in the womb and he reaches out to try and grab his brother's foot like, hey, I want to be first coming out. And ever since that, the two of them had a rivalry. The sibling rivalry that existed between Esau and Jacob. But they were very different in temperament. One was a hunter. That was Esau. He was fearless. His father loved that about him because he would bring his father back food that he would have killed in the hunt. And the connection, don't miss this, the connection between father and son, Isaac and Esau, was a connection around food. The Bible says... Isaac loved Esau because Esau ate his venison. It's a connection around food. But Rebekah loved Jacob, and it says nothing else. The reason it says nothing else is because when Jacob was being named, his name actually means deceiver. Jacob was the one always trying to figure out a way to get over he was always the one figuring out the loophole. He was always the one trying to figure things out. He probably was not as big and strapping and strong as Esau, but he was more clever. Bible says in verse 29, and Jacob sawed pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. So Esau is out there, he's hunting, he comes back, maybe he caught something, maybe he didn't. He gets back and Jacob is cooking. And, and as they say, like uh, the, in black churches, they say, you know, he put his foot in it. You know, that food was pretty, pretty tasty. Put all the spices and seasonings in it. Probably like some Cajun lentils, I'm not sure. And, and so when he comes back, it's, it, the food, is, the, 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 the smell of it is, is, is rifting through the air. And here comes Esau famished as it were. He says, listen, feed me. 
the Bible gives you another little thing here. It says that uh, Esau's name was also Edom, which means red. And uh, it, it goes back to Adam, which is also into the root of the word red. So there are those who say that Adam's name really means like red man. That, that, and you could argue that if you looked at Adam, he would look like a composite of all ethnicities and all races. He wouldn't have been black or white. He'd have been red. Probably would have looked like some of the indigenous peoples from different parts of the world. The Bible says in verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day your birthright. Remember what he is? He's a deceiver. So his brother's hungry. He didn't beat his brother to get out of the womb first, so he'd be the one that gets the birthright. Jacob has been conspiring his entire life as to how does he win back the birthright he didn't win at the time when they were born. And I would bet he was sitting there planning this thing, and he probably made sure to make some really delicious food. So when his brother came back hungry, he had him a setup, a trap to get him on food. He knew his brother loved to eat. He says, sell me a birthright. Verse 32 says, and Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? This is what some of us say. You know, you come home, you say, I'm starving. And we live in America, so most of us are not starving whatsoever. In fact, some of us could go six, seven days without food. We'd be just fine. Some of us even longer. And, but this attitude, like, look, I've got to eat right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. And he says, and then he says something profound. He says, and what does it profit me? If I have this birthright, what profit is this birthright to me if I die of hunger here? And Jacob said, look, swear to me this day. That's, a, in other words, make a contract. And swear unto, and he swore unto him, and he, said his birth, and he swore, sold his birthright unto Jacob. Verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau bread and a pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. The Bible then says, and thus Esau despised his birthright. What was so important about the birthright? Well, one of the things that was so important about the birthright is it meant that you got a double portion of your father's inheritance. Now, I want you to know Isaac was quite wealthy because you would remember Abraham was also very wealthy. So for you to sell two-thirds of your father's estate for a pot of food says a lot. Number two, you also became the judge over the family. That means you got to make the decisions if there were any disputes. And third, you became the priest of the family. If you had the birthright, you were the priest. In other words, God would speak directly to you. So all of that he sold for nothing. This is from Abarim Publications, a Jewish publication. They say, in the famous soup scene where Esau receives his nickname Edom, the author seems to engage in wordplay. The word for soup in Hebrew is the word azid. It comes from the verb zud or zid, meaning to boil. So the word for soup means like a boiling. It makes sense, right? Soup boils. In the literal sense, that's what it means. But figuratively, it, it means to act proudly or presumptuously. The verb is used in the sense of boiling only one time in the Old Testament. And that's in the scene with Esau and Jacob. All other occurrences of this verb have to do with arrogance or otherwise aggressive attitudes. It stands to reason that a Hebrew audience understood the aggression to be the literal meaning of this verb and the meaning of it of to boil, the figurative one. In other words, what it's saying is when you took a, boil, a bowl of soup and you gave it to someone and you called it a boiling, a zood, what it was saying is you gave him a bowl of pride a bowl of self, a bowl of arrogance. His, in other words, what the Bible was word playing for the Hebrew audience is when he demanded this bowl of soup, he was doing it to his own arrogance. Ellen White says, and for a dish of pottage, he parted with his birthright and confirmed the transaction by an oath. A short time at at most would have secured him food in his father's tents, but to satisfy the desire of the moment, he carelessly bartered the glorious heritage that God himself had promised to his fathers. His whole interest was only in the what? In the present. This is how the devil gets us. You no longer think or act mindfully, is the word that the world uses now. 
You think and act for pleasure. And so, instead of saying, look, I can, let me wait and get a proper meal, let me get something healthy, a lot of times what we say is, look, I'll eat this snack food now, this junk food now, because like Esau said, I'm starving. He was ready to sacrifice the heavenly to the earthly to exchange a future good for a momentary indulgence. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In disposing of it, he felt a sense of relief. Now he, his way was unobstructed. He could do as he liked for this wild pleasure, miscalled freedom. Ellen White says, how many are still selling their birthright to an inheritance pure and undefiled, eternal in the heaven? When I, I taught a smoking class for our hospital a few weeks ago, and I was talking to the, 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 the smokers about um, waiting and trying to wait until the urge for nicotine passes. The study shows that the average person who smokes a cigarette is so good at getting a cigarette in their mouth, and the urge is only last 25, 30 seconds, depending on, on which study. But an average person who smokes has their cigarettes in a place. That's why they put the pockets here on shirts. People would put the cigarette here, pack of cigarettes here. You could get the cigarette out of the pack, light it into your mouth. Some people could do it in under 10 or 12 seconds. So what happens is the craving in the moment has to be filled. And you forget to think about the long-term consequences. Because here's the truth. One cigarette won't kill you. Just like one Twinkie won't kill you. One bag of French fries won't kill you. One bag of Doritos won't kill you. But guess what? Every time we go to eat one, knowing we shouldn't, knowing we need to lose weight or we need to live healthier, what happens to us is we say, this one won't kill me. And we develop habits, as we're going to talk about in a second. And after a while, what one thing wouldn't kill you becomes the norm. The three things the devil does. I want you to get these three things the devil does to make it so we can't control our appetites. Three things he does to gain control over our appetites. The first thing is he causes us to confuse pleasure for purpose. In America, and I see this at work all the time, people believe that the reason you go to work, the reason you work hard and get a check, the reason that you struggle to do this is so that you can buy pleasure for yourself. Now, I mean, I, I, I work a pretty stressful job, and I've heard nurses over the years um, and other people I work with, and they'll, it'll be Tuesday. And literally, they'll say, listen, I can't wait for Friday night. And I say, well, yeah, the weekend will be good, but it's only Tuesday. They say, I can't wait for Friday night because I cannot wait to get my drink on. I'll get my check, and I'm going to go get my drink on. Literally, their whole week is designed around getting to the point where they can actually have alcohol. The whole week, all they do is work hard so that on Friday night, maybe Saturday night, they can dress up, they can put on their good stuff, and they can go out and do it. We have, we have set up a time, the internet went down on this thing, um, we have set up a time where people are more concerned about feeling good than being good. And here's the thing. Many of us have lost. We have no purpose in life. Our only purpose is to figure out a way, literally, to figure out a way to make sure we can buy the next thing that pleases us. And that, that was Esau's problem. So one of the Bible verses that goes to this is Philippians 3 and verse 19. Philippians 3 and verse 19 says this, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. The Bible says that, in fact, if you're not careful, you can make your appetite, your belly, your God. And what you start to do is you look for, an op you look for a way to make it so that, so that, actually, I think it might be working again. You look for a way to make it so that you can always feed your desire to be pleased. Now, we see that in our society. Have you noticed in Hollywood movies, more and more of them, they're smoking weed? People are doing cocaine? I mean, like literally they're normalizing these things. Let me tell you, one of the greatest threats to America right now, in my opinion, to the health of America long term, is the legalizing of marijuana. 
People are teaching that this stuff is harmless, that it's, that it's medical, that it'll, it'll do all that's good for you. And let me tell you, they're not telling you that we have new diseases because of the introduction of marijuana on a wholesale in America. One of them is cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome. Have you heard of that? I've seen multiple patients with that. The, the, the marijuana of today is so high in tetrahydrocannabinoid, or THC, that when you, people smoke it regularly and consistently, which many people do now, it actually causes a reaction where people can't stop throwing up. And I've seen people retching, nothing coming out, and it's because they smoke so much marijuana. But they also don't tell you about cannabis-induced psychosis. Have you heard of that one? In fact, what we have now is that we're, we're seeing people, and this, this isn't even in my notes, but I'm saying this because maybe somebody needs to hear it. We're seeing, in our, we're seeing now that there are people who are smoking marijuana, and they're literally becoming psychotic. I saw a patient just earlier this year came in for, for, uh, for something unrelated, but he, when I was asking, he had like a bronchitis, and I said, do you smoke? And he said, not cigarettes. When people say I smoke, but not, uh, when you ask people if they smoke, and they say not cigarettes, they basically say I'm, I smoke weed. That, that's, that's what that means. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, does it affect you? He says, not. He said, it doesn't affect me physically. He said, it affects me socially. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I'm starting to hear voices. I'm starting to have hallucinations. I said, are you still smoking? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit. There's a story. I want you to get this about marijuana and the legalizing of marijuana. There's a story about a young man who came from one of the Midwest states, one of the more conservative states that hadn't legalized marijuana at the time, probably still hasn't, and Colorado had legalized marijuana. So this kid, in order to have his time with marijuana, right, he, could, he has to sneak around in his home state, he got on a plane and flew to Colorado to have a marijuana vacation. Y'all missing this thing, boy. He wanted to smoke weed at will, eat weed brownies and all kinds of stuff. And so he went, he got a hotel room up on one of the high floors of the hotel. He went to the weed shop and he bought a marijuana brownie. The person selling him the brownie said, listen, this thing is quite potent. Do not eat it all at once. Do not do what? Don't eat it all at once. There's too much weed in it. And he said, you got to eat one-fourth at a time. And he told him, you, and you got to space it out like every eight hours. When that boy got back to the hotel, you think he did that? He was from okie-doke country, from way out in the woods somewhere. And he got back to the hotel, and he had a giant marijuana brownie. And he ate the whole brownie at one sitting. Probably washed it down with a glass of milk. And it was too much. Within a short period of time, we began to have the hallucinations. We began to see things. The boy went into acute cannabis-induced psychosis. And he jumped from the hotel window to his death. We are living in a time when people are simply looking for how they can be pleased. Why? Let me tell you why. I learned this from the veterans when I was working in addiction medicine at the VA hospital in Loma Linda, California. And after a group session, they began to do these chants. And one of the chants was, God made the human heart so big that only he can fill it. I said to him afterwards, what does that mean? And one of the veterans said to me, he said, listen, God made your heart so big that the only thing that can make you ever feel satisfied is to fill the God-sized hole in your heart with God. He said, if you try and fill it with anything else, you will be an addict to that thing, whether it's pornography, marijuana, cocaine, it doesn't matter. You become addicted to that thing because there's a God-sized hole in all of our hearts. And if you don't fill it with the right thing, your appetite for that thing becomes your God. In fact, one preacher said it best when he said this, Dr. James Kyle, a physician and pastor, he said, your body will conspire to kill you. If you give yourself everything you want, your body will conspire to kill you. Every desire, every demand. This is why we have sexually transmitted diseases now that we, are, we have no way to treat. People used to say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Not herpes, that comes home with you. Gonorrhea, we are down to one antibiotic to treat gonorrhea now. 
So you got to be careful what you do on Saturday night. Everybody wants to be a baller and a shot caller. And then they come to, my, come to the office, and I'm like, I got to give you a shot of Rosephin. And grown 20-something-year-old men crying because they scared of needles. That's the world we live in. The consequences to these things. And if you give every time your body craves something, it wants something, it desires something, whether it's that cheesecake, that cheesecake looks so good, the cheesecake calls your name. But watch this. The cheesecake is, that, that desire for the cheesecake is a manifestation of your body conspiring against you. Because if every time you, want, you ate what you wanted to, smoked what you wanted to, drank what you wanted to, Ultimately, it will literally kill you, but your body craves it anyway. Ellen White says this, Great Controversy, page 388, 338. This is the chapter where she has, she's given um, the, the talk Satan gives to his imps. So this is really like she's, she's talking and, and letting you know what Satan is saying to his imps. It says, we must exert all our wisdom, this is what Satan says, and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. We can separate many from Christ by worldliness, lust, and pride. They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth, but indulgence of appetite or the lower passions will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination. Uh, this will cause their fail, their fall. Ellen White says that, in fact, Satan understands that some of us know the truth. We've studied the Bible. We've gone through the Revelation seminars. We get the truth. She says, in order to get them to fall, we've got we've to try and get their lower passions to take over. We've got to get their appetite to be in control. And that's how we'll get them to fall. That's how Esau fell. That's how Eve fell. That's how all but Daniel and the three Hebrew boys fell in, in Babylon. They fell on the point of appetite. So how does that happen? The second point is habits. The devil tricks you into forming habits that work against you. And habits are designed to make things easier. Habits exist in the basal ganglia. It exists in the part of the brain that is, way, that is further down low, down in here. The frontal cortex is out on, in this area. And so in here is where you find emotions and pattern recognition and memories. The prefrontal cortex, this is the most holy place. If your body is a sanctuary, this is the most holy place of your body. And this is where decisions are made, where, 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 where you reason. Isaiah 118 says, come let us reason together. So the devil is always attacking the part of your brain where you reason because re reasoning is how salvation happens. When you reason and come to the conclusion like the prodigal that I'm a mess and I need to go home to my father. So the devil wants to mess up this part of your brain. This is where alcohol hits. It blocks the release of a chemical in your brain. I'll show you a picture in a second called GABA. And GABA is an inhibiting chemical. At marijuana and alcohol stop the release of GABA in your brain so you become disinhibited so that you act from the lower part of your brain. That's why drunk people act so foolish. We were on the plane coming down here, and there was a, there was a couple with some really fancy masks on, and the one guy a seat in front of them got totally drunk. He was wasted by the end of the flight. He got up and he looked at the lady, almost staggering, trying to find his luggage, and he said, you don't have to worry about the coronavirus. It's nothing. I mean, loud. He says, I've got HIV and I'm fine. My grandmother used to say, my Jamaican grandmother would say, a drunk man's tongue is a sober man's mind. That's why the devil, the Bible says, the drunk will not inherit the kingdom of God. Alcohol is one of the great ways that the devil gets into the frontal cortex. And so when these habits are forming, God gives us the ability to make habits because what happens is it actually gives us extra ability to, to create it with, through boutons, little sacks of acetylcholine, which causes us to have deeper grooves in our mind around an action. So when you learn to play the piano, there are grooves in your mind that are formed to make it easier to play the piano. So every time you play the piano, you get better and better and better at playing the piano. Acetylcholine through, through the, through the, uh, in the basal ganglia does that. When that happens, you can turn off the frontal lobe on that issue. 
So you no longer, a great pianist doesn't have to think about where to put their fingers or how to play. They can focus on what the singer's doing and adjust. A great typist doesn't have to think about the keys and what they're typing. They can type while they're thinking about what to type. God gave us that ability because it separates us from the animals. Our human brain is 33% frontal lobe. An animal's brain, the smartest animal, the, the porpoise or the chimpanzee, is only 13% frontal lobe. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. This ability to do this is powerful, but the devil hijacks it. And he takes this and he realizes, if I can get you to smoke cigarettes, you also form a habit. And it becomes easier and easier and easier and harder and harder to stop. If when you come home from school, young people, you plop down in front of the TV, grab a bag of Doritos, every day you do that, guess what happens? Before long, you don't even think about it unless there's no Doritos left in the cupboard. And then you're yelling, like, who ate the last Doritos? It becomes automatic. And this is where the devil wants to leave us. In fact, here's an electron micrograph of the same thing. Those are Boutons. When we develop a habit, we literally change the anatomy of our brains. I want you to get that. If you form a habit around something, you change the anatomy of your brain. And you, here's the thing. The science says you can never undo that habit. Once those bounds are formed, it's permanent. But the good news is if you form new habits, better habits, healthier habits, they can run deeper grooves in your brain, and you'll revert to those habits rather than the dangerous ones. Ellen White says it like this. In the Signs of the Times, August 6, 1912, she says, It is by a repetition, a repetition of acts that habits are established and character confirmed. Our habits make our character. And what is the only thing you get to take to heaven with you? Your character. Are you starting to see how this plays out? Why the devil wants you in bad habits? Because if he can get you in the wrong habits, like not praying every day, not having family worship. If he can get you out of those habits and into other habits where you're watching reality TV or keeping up with the Kardashians rather than keeping up with the Lord and the Holy Spirit, those habits form your character. Uh, uh, Paul says it like this, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye, that, ye, that, ye, uh, but that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I wanted to show you this real quick. This is, this is dopamine. So when someone does cocaine, nicotine, it is this green pathway, dopamine in the brain, that gives you pleasure. Dopamine, you get pleasure from when you drink water, it, you release dopamine. You eat food, it releases dopamine. You, you do cocaine, it releases a truckload of dopamine. Sex is the highest natural dopamine. That's why you can become addicted to sex. And that's why God intended that we are raised uh, pure sexually and then we get married. So that the connection with dopamine between husband and wife, that's the only form of that highest form of natural pleasure is connected to the face of that person in conjunction with the hormone oxytocin. So there's a bond form between husband and wife that is actually neurochemical. Y'all missing this thing. The problem is when you're sleeping with everybody and you're doing, you, you know, you, you running through the no-tell motels of Miami and you make a connection with everybody, you leave a piece of yourself with all of those people neurochemically. And then when you go to get married now, it's difficult to be happily married because you've been over-connected with all those other people and your neurotransmitter system can connect ple sexual pleasure with other people other than your spouse. But here is GABA. This one is to inhibit so that you behave differently, so you have more control. And that's what alcohol and marijuana block. So what happens? Well, the devil figured he can hijack even the addiction pathway of food. And one great example of that is the, is the Dorito. Now, you got to think about it. There's really no such thing as a Dorito. This is a man-made entity. There's no Dorito trees, no Dorito farms, not even a Dorito animal. But what? They found out, and, and the guy's name who writes the book, I forgot it in first service, his name is Michael Moss. And the book is called uh, Salt, Sugar, Fat. He shows you how the food industry in America has designed food that is addicting. Did you get that? 
A Dorito is a great example of that. Try and eat one Dorito. I dare you. You get one Dorito in a few seconds, you're like, you know what, I need another one of them Jones. Well, that, that was, my whole head is tingling after that Dorito, that cheesy, salty, spicy. Then, of course, they start putting like jalapeno Doritos and all kind of, trying to overload you. But they designed, I want you to get this, they designed this food in a factory. Chemical engineers designed the food, like chemists designed the food, so that it has a great crunch. So you think like an apple crunch is crunch, it's fresh. Then what they do is they mix salt, sugar, and fat, and the combination of the three releases more dopamine in the brain. Because before they could manufacture food like this, you are, the body was designed to look for those substances in nature. So they hijack that pathway. Now when you eat a Dorito, it's like edible crack. Same like a honey bun, like a, like a Twinkie. The food is not a Twinkie. Is a Twinkie real food? A Twinkie is not real food. I challenge you, go get, if they still sell Twinkies, do they still sell Twinkies? If they still sell Twinkies, I challenge you to put one or go online and look up Twinkies, how long a Twinkie or a Happy Meal will last. You can put a Twinkie or a Happy Meal in the cupboard of your house this New Year and next New Year's Eve. You can pull down that Twinkie, that thing is still spongy and soft. The Happy Meal still looks like you just picked it up at McDonald's. And you got to ask yourself, how can food not spoil in 365 days? The answer is, it's not real food. As Michael uh, Pollard calls it, Poland calls it, it's a food-like substance. And the reason the food can last 365 days plus and still look the same is because even the bacteria and the fungus understand it's not real food. They won't even eat it. You eating food fungus won't eat. I want you to think about that for a second. Designer food. Look at this one. Marketing habit, bad habits. So they start teaching. In 2017, uh, black teens saw more than twice as many ads for unhealthy food products as white teens. But read the, let's read the whole thing. Food companies have introduced healthier products and established corporate responsibility programs to support health and wellness among their customers. But this study shows that they continue to spend 8 out of 10 TV advertising dollars on fast food, candy, sugary drinks, and unhealthy snacks, with even more advertising for these products targeted to black and Hispanic youth. This was a study done at the University of Connecticut. So what do they do? You go into the hood and there's a, there's a sign up top, childhood obesity. Don't take it lightly. Your child is going to get diabetes and die. Feed your child right. And right underneath, my kind of shopping spree. That lady is double fisting two bags of McDonald's. Even better is this one. Desayuna rapido por one dollar. In other words, listen, you can get your fix fast at McDonald's. Me encanta. They're trying to say, listen, you better love it. This is avatar. This is magic. People driving down the highway, people nearly crash. Some people seeing these signs. The third thing the food industry does, it has created foods that will disrupt your system for satiation. Some of us battle feeling full. You can eat and eat and eat and you never get full and you wonder why is that. I'm about to show you what has happened to food in the modern era compared to how God designed food to be and why some of us, it feels like you can eat and you just never get full. You can eat right again, right back again. Here's what happens. So in the system here, this is where you take food. If your food is high in fiber, as the Bible says it should be, all of a sudden what happens, you're in your colon, your, the, the, the gut biome, all of the healthy bacteria in your gut will take that food and it will create short-chain fatty acids. They go through a process that gives a signal for you to, signal for you to eat less um, and, to, and, and you start to stop eating, the signal that comes out. Then you, you might, so your food intake goes down, your fiber intake goes down, the process goes around and you get another symbol, signal here to eat more food. Notice. That having um, low fiber is the trigger to make you want to eat again. That's the natural way we were designed to eat. We were designed by a God who understood our bodies. I'm about to show you this. 
In Genesis 1.29, this is what the Bible says about what we should eat. Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. Fruits have seeds in them, which is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree in the, which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. Inherently right there is nuts, seeds, and fruits. In the Garden of Eden, that's what the diet was. And it was a perfect diet. They would have lived forever on that diet. Then what happened is they sinned. And when they sinned, they got kicked out of what? Kicked out of the garden. But what else began to happen in the world? Deterioration. Things began to spoil and rot. Things begin to oxidize even. And the Bible says here that God says then, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto you. You shall eat the what? The herb of the field. What is the herb of the field? That's vegetables. So the Bible says you started off with fruits, nuts, and, 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 and seeds. But then it says you got to eat, now you got to eat the herb of the field, which is the vegetable and its root, right? So potatoes, yucca, cassava, and all of green leafy vegetables that grow, cucumbers, all that stuff. That's what God said. And then it said bread, which tells you it, grains were good to eat. Daniel 1.12 then says that when he was going against Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, beseech thee ten days and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. What does pulse actually mean? Beans, lentils. The Bible gives you a clear description of what you're supposed to eat. Fruits, nuts, seeds, grains, vegetables, root foods, and beans. That is the diet God designed. All high in fiber. Now watch this. There's something called the Latino paradox. I don't know if you've ever read this or studied it. But the Latino paradox tries to explain how Latinos who don't really live often in the best socioeconomic situations often live longer than their white counterparts. And people can't understand it. One study, and there are probably more than one study now, suggests that in fact this is because Latinos eat more beans. And beans have that much of a protective effect. That's how powerful beans are. So what happens when you stop do eating those high fiber foods? Well, you can see you block the fiber intake here. All of this falls off and you have no fiber. And all you get is the signal to keep eating more. That's the only signal you get. So those of us who are eating a low fiber, standard American diet, a sad diet, what happens is you never feel full because you're not eating enough fiber the way God intended. Because when American food companies make food, they pull the fiber out of it, they pull the nutrients out of it so it can have more shelf life. That's why that Happy Meal can sit there for a year. They've stripped it of everything that anyone should want to eat. If you put it back, your weight will naturally come down and you will get healthier if you add all that fiber back to your diet, as the Bible says. About Proverbs 23, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to your throat if you be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are what? They're deceitful meat. 12% of U.S. calories come from plants now. That's it. We don't barely eat plants like God said. This is what a whole food, plant-based food pyramid would look like. This is the way the Bible says that we should eat. Notice that even here they say unlimited amounts of vegetables and plenty of leafy greens and plenty of fruits. That's the way we're supposed to eat. And so they've introduced and said to these foods like hot Cheetos where you get vanishing caloric density. They've made a Cheeto. This is where Cheeto gets you. And it's funny because, you know, it's flu season. And I get some families where they bring the kids in every week with a cold. And I say, what? You know, it doesn't make sense. Your kid is always sick. I said, what do you feed your child? And they said, oh, you know, just the regular stuff. The kid is guilty. Hand is red from the hot Cheetos. He still got hot Cheeto stains on his hand. He rubbing hot Cheeto on his leg. I said, man, you can't just eat, feed the child hot Cheeto. He's not Pac-Man. You, you got to actually give him real food. I was preaching, I was telling him this morning, I was preaching in San Diego like three weeks ago at a black church. And boy, you think this is hard here. Try and preach this at a black church. Talking bad about cheese and stuff. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And I got onto the hot Cheetos. Woo! This one sister stood up in the middle of the sermon. I, I started talking about hot Cheetos. She stood up and she said, mm -mm, you're not going to talk about, I'm not going to listen to you talk about my hot Cheetos. And she walked right out. The she was doing this the whole way out the church. No, no, don't you be talking about my hot Cheetos. After church, she came up to me and she said, I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry I walked out on you talking about hot Cheetos, but I love hot Cheetos. 
I said, I'm, I said, ma'am, you know, we all have our things. She said, I've only had seven strokes. I said, you might want to give up them hot Cheetos, ma'am. They full of salt and cholesterol. They fatty and terrible. But what the food industry has figured out, when you crunch the Cheeto, then it melts in your mouth. This is the concept of the vanishing caloric density. The brain is told, listen to this, when food melts in your mouth, it tells your brain you didn't eat the calories. That's why you can just eat hot Cheetos all day. Because it's like your brain is saying, I didn't eat anything. I heard a crunch, then nothing. Where's the food? These are the hormones. I'm going to skip through some of this. This is about leptin resistance. But here's what Paul says for those of us who struggle with weight. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says that after he says, he sa Paul says, the good that I would, I do not, and that which I would not, that I do. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Again, your body will conspire to kill you. If you give your body everything it wants, it will have you laid up in the hospital. Getting heart catheterizations, it'll have you in the hospital trying to recover from a stroke. Your body will do that to you. Ellen White says the world is given to self-indulgence. Errors and fables abound. Satan's snares for destroying souls are multiplied. All, all who would perfect holiness in the fear of God must learn the lessons of temperance and self-control. The appetites and passions must be held in subjection to the higher powers of the mind, the frontal lobe. This self-discipline is essential to the mental strength and spiritual insight which will enable us to understand and to practice the sacred truths of God's word. For this reason, temperance finds its place in the work of preparation for, the, for Christ's second coming. I want to submit to you that if you want to be ready when Jesus comes, it's the battle with appetite is a battle you must wage. It is one of the most difficult battles. Do you believe Jesus is coming soon? Let me tell you something. We watch fires burn in Australia and over a billion animals die. Unprecedented prophetic fulfillment. We're watching, as Jesus said, that in the last days pestilence would come. You're watching pestilence as the coronavirus. And this isn't the first coronavirus. Remember SARS? That was a coronavirus. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that was a coronavirus. This coronavirus is just the right type to circle the globe. Let me tell you something. We're this afraid of this virus, and it only has a case fatality rate of 2%. What happens when the next one comes and its case fatality rate is 15 or 20%? I'm telling you that the world is ready to go into panic, that much of what we understand in prophecy is about to be fulfilled. You're watching it on the news every night. And my Bible is telling me that God wants a people who are prepared to see him, who have a character just like Christ. And Christ had a character that was temperate. When Satan tempted him on the issue of appetite, he said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone. So how do you win this battle? Well, one of them is you avoid processed food. You exercise. You exercise not because exercise makes you lose weight, but because exercise reduces stress and makes you feel better. You should fast intermittently. They all talk about intermittent fasting. The Bible teaches intermittent fasting. Did you know that? God only served people food twice a day. The ravens came to Elijah twice a day, and the manna fell twice a day. Intermittent fasting. Make sure you get your sleep. This is one of the reasons caffeine is so dangerous. I was talking to him this morning about how caffeine reduces cerebral blood flow, blood flow to your brain by up to 23% with every caffeinated drink you have. And they've had, they have caffeine drinks now that are super caffeinated, like monster drinks. These drinks actually have, are taking the lives of young athletes. And when you drink caffeine, even if you just have a cup of coffee in the morning, it will affect your sleep that night. But again, like I said, eat lots of fiber. Ecclesiastes 10, 17 says, blessed are you when your princes eat in due season. What are we supposed to eat for as princes in the house of God? For strength and not for drunkenness. Let me finish with a quote from Ellen White. Multitudes are selling their birthright for sensual indulgence. Health is sacrificed, the mental faculties are enfeebled, and heaven is forfeited, and all for a mere temporary pleasure on indulgence and indulgence at once both weakening and debasing in its character. 
as Esau awoke to see the folly of his rash exchange when it was too late to recover his loss, so it will be in the day of God. And those who have bartered their earship to heaven for self-gratifications. And I'll leave you with this. Do not sell your heavenly birthright for Satan's pot of pride. And I'm going to finish by giving you a little bit of my story. Most of the times I have in this church when people come and they give these testimonies, they've been skinny their whole lives. They were raised on beets and, and straw grass and, they, you know, they were doing all of the Adventist things they do to stay super healthy. Some of them lived out in the country, never know what it's like to live in the city. And they come into your church and they're like, listen, you all are sitting because you eat too much. That's easy for you to say if you grew up in a house where you never had the temptation of Pop-Tarts and stuff like I did. That's difficult stuff. So some of us know what it's like to struggle with food, and I'm one of them. I was born 10 pounds, 14 ounces. I've been big my whole life. I was a phenomenal football player. I have two cousins who played in the NFL. I was a phenomenal football player. But there's a point you get to where the devil begins to control you by controlling how and what you eat. In fact, as Paul says, food becomes so important that you sitting in church, and rather than thinking about what's being preached or sang, you're trying to figure out just how much seasoning you're going to put on that chicken when you get home. <laughs> food becomes all-encompassing, and we live to eat rather than eating to live. And I want you to understand that for me, I had to, I had to draw a line. And last year, as the year was coming to an end, I just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We went to, my brother was a, was a famous cricket player, Courtney Walsh, used to uh, be the captain of the West Indian cricket team. And my brother and I, we went down, and my wife went down to Antigua to his wedding. And I came home and looked at the pictures from the wedding, and I was aghast. I said, man, I look horrific. I wanted to repent. I couldn't even repent. It was that bad. I said, Lord, this sin is so big. I'm not sure how to repent on this one. And I, and I began to pray and talk to God. And I said, listen, I need a strategy, Lord. I got to get out of this. I got to find a way to lose weight. And I began to reread some of my books. I reread Councils on Diets and Foods by Ellen White. I reread Ministry of Healing. I went back and reread some books by Dr. Furman and Dr. Um, uh, Michael Greger. I began to reread some of these things. And I began to say, I don't have to be trapped like this. God must have a way. Then when I went and studied the scripture and I began to look at how God designed for us to eat, I, be, I, I began to realize America is like Babylon, like sitting in front of Nebuchadnezzar. They have designed a meal to strip you of your spiritual potency. And we are sitting at the table eating Babylon's meat and drinking its wine and saying, I love you, Jesus. I said, that's got to stop. I've got to excuse myself from Babylon's table. I began to take out the processed foods, even the processed veggie meat. Oh, somebody missing this thing. I know them grillers taste good and them chick nuggets and all that stuff, but it's high sodium processed food. I began to substitute jackfruit for that stuff, mushrooms for that stuff. Began to remove that stuff. Then the Bible says when, when Jesus cast out the demoniac boy, the Bible says when the disciples came to him and said, why couldn't we cast him out? Jesus said, some things come only by prayer and fasting. And I said, listen, I've tried to move this mountain by myself, and the mountain just keeps getting bigger, Lord. Fast. And began to institute, and I went on, I'm on a juice fast. And I began to just go through this thing, and I said, listen, Lord, I need victory. And I don't need short-term victory. That's easy. I need a lifelong victory because that's what's difficult. Mark Twain, you know what Mark Twain, the great author, said about cigarettes? He said, quitting cigarettes is the easiest thing I've ever done. I've done it a thousand times. It's like me. Eat, losing weight is the easiest thing I've ever done. I've lost weight a thousand times. How do you stay there? The secret is in the Bible. The literally victory is in the scripture. And so when I did all that, I started off at 350 pounds. I stand before you today down 300 pounds. This, I couldn't even button this suit. Matter of fact, I'd stop wearing this suit. Very nice suit, too. I like this suit. I want you to understand that what I'm not coming to you telling you about diet and temperance and, and health because I'm some high and mighty person who can swoop down and point out all of your faults. I'm telling you. Like Paul said, I am chief among sinners. 
But I am also a Christian who believes that there is power in the word of God. I'm a Christian who believes that there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And some of us are struggling with food. Some of you are struggling with maybe marijuana or alcohol. I am here today to tell you that there's power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And if you want victory, today I challenge you to claim victory in Jesus Christ. And as I close, if there's somebody who wants that victory, I just want you to stand where you are. And we're going to have a special prayer right now. That God would give you victory over whatever thing it is you're struggling. Some of you, it's not food, I know. But whatever it is, we don't need to know what you're struggling with. Just stand where you are. We're going to pray and ask God to give us victory. That we would be healthy in 2020. That we would take this health message that God has given us seriously and walk in that light. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, you know we have failed you in the area of temperance, many of us, maybe most of us. Lord, we failed you over and over again with empty promises. Lord, with guilt and shame as we look in the mirror at our pictures. And Lord, we go around and around and around in this thing, hoping one day that magically we get a victory. Father God, there's no magic for this. We need to walk closer to you. Our righteousness comes by our faith. So we've got to trust in you. So Father God, the folk who are standing right now, there's something in their lives they want to give up. It could be caffeine, it could be alcohol, it could be marijuana, cocaine. I don't know what it is, Lord. It could be food. It could be fast food, junk food. It could be a certain type of cake. I don't know what they're struggling with, Lord. I just know that I know the one who can help them win the struggle. So, Father God, today I'm asking for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I am asking, Lord, for you to give us not just the unction to do this, but, Lord, give us the plan. Help us to go back into your word, to go back into what you meant for us, that we would go back to your original diet, the original way you wanted us to live, and that we might live so that we are better prepared, so that we have the character of Christ when Christ comes. Bless your people with that. Give us victory today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.